Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Krikorian. I'm executive director of the Center for Immigration Studies, and we've done a series of uh, interviews with important players in the immigration issue, whether in Congress or in the administration. And this morning's guest is Senator Cotton, the junior senator from Arkansas. Uh, senator Cotton is a Harvard Law grad, served as an Army infantry officer in Iraq and Afghanistan. He's on several committees, banking, intelligence, armed services, but obviously what we're going to talk about today is immigration. He's been a leader in the immigration issue even before the president um, kind of raised its profile. And so I appreciate, Senator, you're coming in and giving us some time. He's going to have to bolt for a meeting on the Hill, so um, we're, we'll cut this off at uh, 8.15. My first question is, um, uh, you're, a, as I understand, a sixth generation Arkansan. Um, Arkansas has been attracting more immigrants than it used to, but it's clearly not a immigration state. It's not one of the leading immigration states. What is it that attracted you to get involved in this issue and become really something of a thought leader and a debate leader? Well, Mark, first off, thanks for having me this morning. Thanks for the Center for Immigration Studies for hosting this conversation, also for all the very important work the center does on immigration. You know, immigration is a central issue for the United States, really for a lot of countries around the world. It touches on so many uh, concerns that Arkansans have about prosperity, security, community. Um, I remember before I was in politics, you know, when I was in the Army, uh, Congress trying to pass, in my opinion, deeply misguided laws in 2006 and 2007. Uh, in fact, 2007 was probably the only time I've written to my members of Congress asking them to oppose that terrible immigration bill. So it was an issue of personal interest to me because it's an issue of such great import to our country, especially a country like America that is ultimately, as FDR said, founded on immigrants and the descendants of immigrants, not a country whose origins are lost in the mists of time. And since I've been in Congress, it's been a primary focus of mine as well. Um, one of my main accomplishments in my two years in the House of Representatives uh, was to stop that dreaded immigration bill in 2013 in its tracks. The Gang of Eight bill. Yeah, yeah, after it had passed in the Senate um, about this time of year, uh, right before the 4th of July week back home, um, and then through the month of July uh, to try to bring to light just how flawed that bill was, just what a terrible impact it would have on American workers and families and communities, uh, and to keep it stopped because the forces behind that bill never seemed to quite give up. And uh, since I've come to the Senate, I I've tried to focus as well uh, on reforming other aspects of our immigration system, uh, like my legislation that would revamp our uh, legal immigration system towards one focused more on high-skilled workers and away from mere extended families and random lotteries. Uh, and, other matters like that. Uh, so it's, a, it's an issue about which I'm personally passionate and that matters to Arkansans and I think matters deeply to, to most Americans. And that's the next question I wanted to ask was about the, your legislation, the RAISE Act. Now you, as you described, you've been interested in immigration before it was cool, as it were. Um, in other words, it's uh, the president obviously made it a high profile issue, but you were working on this before that was an issue. And you were one of the authors and co-sponsors of the RAISE Act, and it was reintroduced this year. And that bill, not to go into a lot of detail, you obviously know what it's about, but the point is it would move immigration away from family connections, get rid of the, some of the chain migration categories. But it would have a reduction in immigration. Um, probably not as much as some people said. Some people were talking about half, 50% reduction. It probably wouldn't have done that, but it would have been a significant reduction in immigration. And the president obviously endorsed it. You had an, he had an event for you and Senator Perdue at the White House when you first introduced it. This year, though, repeatedly he's been saying, we need more immigration. This is, you know, we needed the highest levels ever. Um, you don't seem to have gone along with that program. I'm just wondering, what are your what are your think what are your thoughts about that? Well, so let me uh, let me go back to first why uh, I first wrote the Raise Act uh, a couple years ago and what we hope to accomplish with it. Um, there's no lack of uh, people in Congress focused on things like. Uh, security and enforcement, or uh, our temporary guest worker programs, all things that, that are, are very immediate, sometimes things that are, people are just looking for quick fixes. Uh, 
nothing against quick fixes, especially when we have serious problems like we do with the asylum frauds going on at the border right now. But there weren't that many people focused on our legal immigration system. Um, and to me, that's one of the cornerstones of our immigration system because it's about not just how we generate workers for our economy, but citizens for our country. And, and that's what we ultimately should focus on is bringing in new citizens who are gonna help contribute to the American story. Um, and as I studied our legal immigration system, I realized it was just a, a mishmash uh, of quotas and random set-asides and policies that are outdated and that no one could even explain. I mean, only one out of 15 workers today comes here because of the skills and the job that they're gonna have. Almost, It's almost entirely because at some point in the past, they had some distant relative who made it to the United States somehow or another. And even those who do come here because of their employment uh, don't really reflect the needs of our economy. I mean, we, we have all kinds of set-asides and quotas in our employment-based immigration system that make no sense. I mean, we even have quotas set aside for foreign lawyers to come to this country. You know, a lot of people talk erroneously about jobs Americans won't do or we don't have enough. I know that the one thing we have enough of is lawyers in this country. Maybe we imported more to yeah, well, uh, get so, the wages down no, for lawyers. No kidding. Um, so uh, that's why I focused on the RAISE Act, and I, I focused on trying to, I looked at the criteria we consulted with uh, some uh, really thoughtful experts in places like Australia and Canada who had employed this system. We wanted an easily administered system. So we try to identify criteria that are, that are very simple, they're straightforward, they can't be gamed, but they contribute significantly to success for new immigrants in this country. So age, younger Americans, better than older Americans if you're bringing in new Americans because you want people to work and be productive and pay taxes for their entire lifetime their education level and their educational uh, field, so things like engineering and mathemat math mathematics, uh, the kind of uh, job that they're going to have in their local economy, you know, a $100,000 wage in Fort Smith, Arkansas goes a lot farther than it does in New York City, so taking into account those kinds of differences. Ability to speak English, one of the single most important criteria for success in our country. Um, any kind of exceptional skill or talent, you know, whether they're a Nobel Prize winning physicist or world-class opera singer or a 100 mile an hour fastball pitcher, and things that could be uh, reset and evaluated every six months, every 12 months. That's why we uh, wrote the RAISE Act. I think there's widespread agreement that that's the kind of immigration system we need. Um, as, as it relates to numbers, the numbers uh, that we had in the RAISE Act would gradually decline over time because of the reduction in extended family migrations. So you can't bring in aunts and uncles and cousins and all the rest by refocusing the number of green cards on employment-based systems. Now, as you say, there's some debate about the appropriate number of immigrants um, and the actual impact that the legislation would have. I think once you get the, the system right, once the criteria are set, then that's an appropriate um, space for legislative compromise. Um, I tend to think that we are at historically elevated numbers, as high as we've been um, since you know, right before the 1924 Immigration Act. Now, almost one in seven Americans are foreign born. Um, I think, you know, because most of those foreigners when they come here are unskilled and low skilled workers, that's one reason why um, Americans with high school degrees who are working with their hands and on their feet all day long have seen their wages suffer for so long. So I tend to think that a gradual decline um, over time while refocusing also on high skilled workers will be uh, very beneficial for unskilled and low-skilled American workers. But again, that's an area where I think once you get the system right, the criteria, the baseline standards for how we're admitting new uh, foreign nationals to ultimately become citizens, the total level of uh, immigration is an area for legislative compromise. The, uh, it, it's interesting because what you described in your RAISE Act is not really that dissimilar from what we saw 20 plus years ago with the Barbara Jordan Commission. Yeah. Barbara Jordan's a leading Democrat, was a bipartisan commission. Bill Clinton endorsed the legislation initially. Um, and that's kind of a way I wanted to get to the question about today's Democrats and immigration. Um, there was actually, I mean, I don't know, I, I'll use the words, there was, they were a lot more sensible uh, from my perspective, a lot less, a lot more centrist, I guess, in the past as President Clinton and Barbara Jordan and others demonstrate, uh, we're doing this on July 30th and tonight and tomorrow, the next round of Democratic presidential debates. 
And frankly, the Democratic Party seems to have gone kind of bonkers on immigration. This started before President Trump's election, but it really has accelerated since then. At the previous round of debates, everyone raised their hand and supported decriminalizing infiltration across the border. They all raised their hands and endorsed taxpayer-funded Medicare for illegal aliens. Now, Congresswoman Omar has tweeted demanding taxpayer-funded abortions for illegal aliens, which is almost like something Republican oppo researchers would have dreamed up over a couple of beers on a Saturday night, and yet it's a real thing. And so my question for you is, what, what's, what's going on with your colleagues across the aisle? Yeah, I, I think you put it well. I, I would just restate it, say the Democrats have lost their mind when it comes to immigration. Um, Barbara Jordan uh, and I probably wouldn't have agreed on much uh, if we had served in Congress together, but on this, she was largely right. Um, a lot of old Democratic union leaders you know, used to have this view of immigration as well. I think as the Democrats have um, become a party focused less on kitchen table issues, on what matters to working our Kansans when they're worried about not having enough paycheck uh, to make it to the end of the month, or worried about you know, providing for their kids' braces or their education. Um, that uh, they've just focused a lot more on questions of race, gender, sex, identity. And for them, it's become more of a question of identity than a question about economics and security. And you know, if you're rich, you know, if you're a rich lobbyist and you live in Bethesda, or, you know, you're a rich ex-president and you live in Chappaqua outside New York, um, you know, uh, mass migration is a pretty good bargain for you. Um, you know, they're not Immigrants are not coming here to take your job as a lobbyist or take your job giving $200,000 speeches. Um, <clears throat> so you don't have to worry about the impact it has on your local economy. You know, you're not sitting in an emergency room waiting to get health care, uh, but you know, not being able to see a doctor. Uh, and in the meantime, you know, it drives down the price of all the personal services that you depend on uh, in fields where you have a lot of immigrants working, like uh, child care and house cleaning. And, Landscaping, landscaping, manicures and pedicures, right. and creates like you know exciting new fusion restaurants as well. Right. So in, in the story in Bethesda, uh, in Chappaqua, and Los Angeles, and Silicon Valley of mass migration is a pretty unalloyed good, you know. But if you're in rural Arkansas or you're along the border in Texas or manufacturing communities in the upper Midwest, uh, it's it's opposite story. But the Democratic Party uh, largely represents those elites on the coast now. They don't represent. A lot of uh, hard-working communities across the country. The um, it'll be entertaining. I'm going to be tuning in tonight to see what next thing they're going to have them all raise their yeah, hands. Yeah, well, I, well, no, they're not going to be doing that. As CNN has said that they're not going to have oh, hand raising okay. or yes/no yeah. questions. Too bad. And, well, that's because CNN represent or understands the party that they represent was embarrassed by those right, hand raising right, exactly, questions, yeah, so they, they don't want to do. It was basically it. Republican campaign advertising. Yeah, CNN doesn't want to do anything to hurt their party. Right. <laughs> So um, on some specific issues that the Senate's going to be dealing with, uh, today, Senator Durbin's expected to bring up the bill for uh, te so-called temporary protected status for Venezuelans. The House passed it recently. Um, I understand he's going to bring it up for unanimous consent and it probably will be objected to. So it's not as though there's going to be a debate today, but the fact is this issue of TPS for Venezuelans um, is one that um, is coming up. And there are some Republicans sympathetic to it because obviously they're fleeing a socialist um, uh, dictatorship. But the, the, uh, we've published results showing that there's basically an informal uh, moratorium on de deportations to Venezuela anyway. Only the hardest cases, handful of people are deported and that's appropriate use of the discretion that DHA has. So my, my question specifically is what do you think about this issue of TPS for Venezuelans and maybe more broadly, do you think this idea of TPS, which we're now dealing with from Haitians and Salvadorans and others where it's not really temporary at all, does that need to be, does this whole structure need to be changed? Yeah, so, so first off, let me express my sympathy to all those Venezuelans who are living here. Many of them have ties to America through family members or uh, education or uh, working here legally for many years, but their uh, you know, status may be about to expire. Um, and let me express my sympathy to Venezuelans living under the corrupt uh, dictatorial regime of um, Maduro. Um, this is the kind of situation that temporary protected status as a program was created to address. It's created to address people who are living, living here legally, came on a visa for instance, um, can't get it renewed, maybe they're a student and their education is done, but for some reason they can't return to their home country safely and reasonably, either 
it's in, uh, there's a famine going on and a brutal socialist crackdown or there's been a natural disaster or what have you. I think most Americans recognize that's a, a sensible, sound policy in principle. The problem is that's not the way it's played out in practice over the last 20 years. As you stress, the T in TPS stands for temporary. There are a few things more permanent, though, than temporary protected status. I mean, we have foreign nationals living in our country today who got TPS protection 10 or 20 years ago while there was a civil war going on in their country, and the war has been settled for over 10 years. Um, ultimately, TPS is not a way to live in this country permanently and to become a citizen. It was a humanitarian, it was designed as a humanitarian gesture. Um, so under normal conditions, what's happening in Venezuela now would be a good candidate for a temporary protected status. But that's not the conditions we live in. Uh, the bureaucracies of both parties for decades have been unwilling to rescind TPS status when it should be rescinded. Now that President Trump finally has done so, you have left-wing judges basically practicing a form of resistance law that is not letting the president withdraw TPS status, which is his prerogative under federal law. So I, I think it's unwise for us to extend more TPS protection to other countries when we can't even withdraw it from countries that have it now. If Senator Durbin and Senator Menendez would like to include in their bill uh, that uh, uh, measures that would overturn those court decisions and say that a decision to rescind TPS status by the president, by the Department of Homeland Security is not reviewable in the federal courts, I'd very much be open to reviewing that. But okay. we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be granting more discretionary status under TPS when the president can't even unwind past grants of TPS status, even though the conditions for which you're granted that status have been, uh, have been gone for years. Um, just to follow up on that one, obviously that would require a president who wanted to rescind the uh, status, and that's, that's never happened before now. Um, are, have you given any thought to reforms to the TPS statute itself? Yeah, so I, I think probably one way to do it is to, rather than make it an affirmative grant um, that uh, the president, or an affirmative step the president has to take to rescind it, as President Trump did in 2017, uh, make it like a reviewable status, like you, you have to make, make it, it a the affirmative step has to be to extend it again. Right. Right. So it's right. things like that so we can make sure that again, we're like, we don't want to send, you know, hundreds or thousands of foreign nationals who are here legally back to a country that has been racked by earthquake um, or by hurricanes that, right. ca that can't process them um, or to socialist hell holes like Venezuela. But at the same time, conditions change. And when you can't return to a country because a civil war is waging, when the civil war is over, you got to go back to your country. Right. When the country's basic infrastructure is recovered from an earthquake or landslides or hurricanes, you got to go back to your country eventually. If you want to stay in this country, you need to apply through another legal avenue to stay in the country. Uh, another piece of legislation that the uh, Senate's likely to deal with is something called the Fairness for High-Skilled Immigrants Act. The uh, House passed this recently, and what it would do is remove what are called the per country caps, which are in the law in order to ensure a certain level of diversity so that one country doesn't sort of take over the whole immigration system. This legislation would remove those caps. And critics have said that even though it won't increase the overall level of immigration, it doesn't do anything to that, it would essentially bring about the takeover of our whole employment-based immigration system by people from India because they're the ones in the waiting lists for mm -hmm. these green cards. You're one of the co-sponsors of the bill, and I just wanted to think, sort of, what are your answers to those critiques? What's the rationale for the so, legislation? So the, the fundamental reason why I think this is a step in the right direction, a modest step in the right direction, but a step in the right direction, um, is that it moves away from the kind of immigration system we have now to the kind of system I want, a system that doesn't care where you come from, but cares what you bring here. Um, so I think that's a step in the right direction. That's why the RAISE Act would eliminate all those country caps and quotas as well. Uh, we want to treat people as individuals no matter where they come from. Now, as you say, as a practical matter, for a few years uh, it would result in a significantly higher number of green cards going to Indian nationals. But it wouldn't increase the number of green cards total, and in fact it wouldn't increase and might even decrease the number of foreign workers coming here on an annual basis, new, new foreign workers being added to our economy because the large, the large number of those Indian nationals who would get green cards are already here working on H-1B visas. Right. Um, and as a practical matter, those visas tend to be extended. Um, but also, I'm not the biggest fan of those H-1B visas either. Again, as I said at the outset, it's important that we bring new workers into our economy. What's even more important is that we produce new citizens that believe in America and want to share in the American dream. 
Um, I, I tell tech companies this a lot because they often are the beneficiaries of these H-1B visas and they come to Washington, they lobby all the time for it. And I just say like, I don't want to give you more H-1B visas. I want to give you more citizens. I want people who are going to come here and be citizens and participate in our country and become Americans and, in fact, also have better bargaining position as it relates to employers. I understand that some employers would rather have an H-1B worker than they would an American citizen because the H-1B worker is almost an indentured servant in right. terms of their bargaining power, their ability to ask for more, uh, uh, more and higher wages and benefits, or just to leave and go to another company. If you have an American citizen and they don't like what they're being paid, and it's a hot job market like we have now, they can always just take their uh, take their skills to another company. So that that would be another positive step in the right direction. The way the uh, lobbyists for the tech companies refer to that is they say H one Bs are more loyal, which is <laughs> to say they can't leave. So um, well, and, and now it's not just. H-1Bs. I mean, it's, right. that's the case in a lot of these right. uh, guest worker programs. That's one reason why, I even though my legislation, the RAISE Act, doesn't focus on the guest worker program, um, I would much prefer to have citizens coming to this country and working as opposed to people who just want to come here and work in our jobs and send their money back home and ultimately go back to their country as well. Not to say that's never appropriate, but there's a lot of abuse in that system. Uh, and in general, American jobs should be going to American workers first. A and that's one of the benefits and one of the good news stories we have from this economy between an economy that is very strong and an immigration uh, system now that is focused more on the needs of American workers, you have for the first time a lot of people coming off the sidelines. Some of the very people that the Democrats say they want to re represent and that they want to get a fair shake, you know, whether they're minority workers or teenage workers or disabled workers or ex-cons, people who are getting jobs that we need done in our society and that we need to get off the sidelines and succeed in America. It's better to, ha better to hire those Americans in those jobs, whether it's a tech job or a landscaping job, what have you, uh, than to import foreign workers for those jobs. Amen. Um, just before I ask the next question, uh, we have cards. If you want to write down a question, I'll be taking questions from the audience uh, in a few minutes. Another thing that's in the news, this is the last week. The administration signed what they billed as a safe third country agreement with Guatemala. The Guatemalans are saying it's not really a safe third country agreement, but the point is the goal the point is to try to deal with the border crisis where people are basically using bogus asylum claims as a means of illegal immigration. Um, the details aren't really clear yet. We found a Spanish version of the text. We haven't found the English version of the text of the deal yet, but apparently part of what the arrangement is is that we're going to give more guest worker visas to Guatemalans, kind of as a, uh, uh, I won't say bribe, but it's a bribe basically for Guatemala to sign the agreement. So generally, what do you think about this idea of a kind of quid pro quo to get Guatemala to cooperate? And more broadly, what should we be doing about this border crisis? Well, we have a crisis right now uh, because some well-intentioned laws and some misguided court decisions have kind of conspired along with activists here in the United States and in Latin America to drive all these this bogus uh, and fraudulent claims of asylum to our border. Look, uh, Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador uh, have many troubles. Um, however, their citizens do not face the kind of persecution based on who they are or what they believe that our asylum and refugee laws were designed for. You know, we, we designed those laws for you know, Jews from the Soviet Union and from Iran or for Christians from Syria. Those are the kinds of people who we have passed asylum and refugees laws because they're being persecuted for being a woman or you know, worshiping the God the way they choose, um, belonging to a certain ethnic or racial group. Or political group, too. Yes. Right. Um, we didn't pass asylum and refugee laws to alleviate the world's suffering. You know, living in a poor country, living in a country that's dangerous, is not grounds for asylum or refugee status. If it were, we would have to admit about six billion people from around the world to our country. There's a, it's only the arbitrary fact that those countries are on the same landmass that we are and they can travel across that landmass and get to our border that has created this crisis in the first place. Um, so we need to take immediate steps to try to resolve the crisis on the border. Um, the president has tried to do that repeatedly, working with Mexico in terms of deploying National Guard to their border, northern and southern border, deeming Mexico a safe third country, trying to get Guatemala to recognize itself as a, self, uh, a safe third country. Again, you have these uh, left-wing Obama judges who are, have a hair trigger anytime the ACLU 
um, or other activist groups come in, they file an immediate nationwide injunction with no basis whatsoever, one of which we just saw overturned last week by the Supreme Court. Um, that needs to stop. I hope the Supreme Court steps in sooner rather than later and takes a firm stand against these activist judges and lets the president execute some of the policies that he and the Department of Homeland Security and the Attorney General Barr just announced another one this week in terms of trying to tighten the standards for asylum. Um, long term, Guatemala and El Salvador and Honduras would send fewer foreign nationals here if they were better places. So we, there's things we can do to help them try to crack down on crime in terms of information sharing or uh, technical uh, expertise and training that our FBI or DEA can provide to them. But we have to recognize those, I mean, that's not going to happen next week. Right. You know, those, those countries in, in Central America, are, are, they're not going to become Norway tomorrow or next year or in the next decade. So those are good long-term proposals um, that we should pursue, but we need to take immediate action to stop the fraud that we see at our border. As a John Maynard Keynes, I think, was the one who said, in the long run, we're all dead, so we can't wait for the long run. And this is, it is true, that, and the, you know, that we're not the only country that's faced this, if you look at what's happened in Europe over the last five, six years uh, with the refugee crisis that the Syrian civil war has generated and the Libyan civil war, both Libya itself and making Libya a place that every country to its south can transit. Um, Europe cannot give refuge to every single person who lives in Africa and Asia that doesn't have the standard of living that Europe does. Simply not possible. Um, and it's not particularly, in my opinion, a, a, a moral policy to do what Angela Merkel did a few years ago, which is say, if you survive the journey, you can come. Right. So encouraging people to make the very dangerous journey across the Mediterranean or through Syria and Turkey and the Balkans, or in our case, up through Central America and Mexico. I mean, if that if she really wanted to, she would just send plane after plane of uh, from Lufthansa into Syria and bring all these people back. But she doesn't. So she's just trying to ameliorate the the problem that she has on her borders. And that's what a lot of Democrats want to do. They just want to ameliorate the people in individual cases without thinking through the long-term policy implications of what you're saying. Right. Especially if you say what the Democrats said in that debate last week, where we're going to decriminalize crossing the border illegally, and we're not going to deport anyone unless they commit a serious felony. And by the way, when you get here, we're going to pay for your health care as well. Right. And that's the definition of an open borders policy. Yep. Um, we Next month, some point, we're going to have a panel discussion actually here at the Press Club. We're going to have a report on the national security challenges from a large foreign student program. And um, you've introduced a targeted legislation on one part of that, um, that students or researchers yeah. uh, who are working for, sponsored by the Chinese army yeah. or intelligence should not be getting student visas. Sort of more broadly, or maybe specifically that, but more broadly, what do you see as the vulnerabilities that our current very large, unlimited foreign yeah. student program creates yeah. for us? Uh, let's not be naive here. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army purposely infiltrates America's universities and research laboratories uh, with agents to try to steal uh, national security secrets. That's not to say that every Chinese student that comes to America uh, is an agent of the Chinese Communist Party or the People's Liberation Army, but we shouldn't be naive about that threat. And we should always err on the side of national security as opposed to beneficence on behalf of foreign students. Um, one way to handle that is to do more thorough background checks on the students that come here. Another way to handle that is to focus on the kind of programs they want to study. Chinese students at national laboratory or affiliated institutes? No. Chinese students at major research universities studying in advanced uh, scientific and engineering programs that do major uh, contract work with the Department of Defense or the uh, intelligence community? No. If Chinese students want to come here and study the great books of the Western tradition so they can learn more about constitutional democracy and individual liberty, I can support that. <laughs> But is there a broader issue? I mean, not just that, first of all, like for instance, Iranian students, not just Chinese in a, in a narrow security sense, but is there a broader issue that we are kind of atrophying our own ability to grow our own tech STEM sure. expertise yeah. as, because there's only so many chairs, there's only so many seats in a lecture hall? Sure. Um, that's right. And, and too many universities have become too reliant um, on Chinese students and Chinese money. Um, 
And again, that's part of China's deliberate policy as well. Even, even if you're not a, an agent of the Chinese government, still sending Chinese students to places like MIT or Caltech or what have you to study um, artificial intelligence or quantum computing and just coming back to China and working in Chinese industry it is much better for China than it is for the United States. Um, and that's something to which we need to be attentive as well. Uh, we have some questions from the uh, audience. One, we talked about the RAISE Act some, but what do you think, what are the prospects of some kind of legislation? Uh, you know, this Congress doesn't seem very yeah. likely, but, you know, is there, a, is there a realistic scenario for something like, say, the RAISE Act so, to be passed? So I knew when we introduced the RAISE Act two years ago that it would be a, a slow and gradual uh, path uh, to build support for it. But we have added two new co-sponsors among the freshman class of senators this year. Uh, we're getting growing support from uh, congressmen in the House of Representatives as well. As you say, I have measured expectations of uh, passing major immigration legislation with uh, Nancy Pelosi in charge of the House. It's amazing that Nancy Pelosi is now in the moderate wing of her party <laughs> in the House of Representatives. And with the Democrats uh, running for president all wanting to decriminalize illegal immigration and give health care to illegal immigrants. I suspect, though, that with another loss to Donald Trump in 2020, that some Democrats may begin to see things in a different way and perhaps go back to the way people like Barbara Jordan viewed the matter. Or for that matter, some of the things that Bill Clinton used to say about illegal immigration in the 1990s, things that would get him excommunicated from today's Democratic Party. Right. So as has often been the case throughout our history on major immigration legislation, the issue percolates for many years uh, before conditions become ripe in Congress. So it's just a matter of continuing to do, do the yeoman's work from day to day in Congress to educate uh, my colleagues and to try to bring them around to our point of view. The um this is not one of the questions I've submitted, but it occurred to me that one of the targeted changes that, you know, I mean, the RAISE Act is a broad kind of rewrite of the whole legal immigration system. But one of the things that everybody seems to be for, President Obama's for it, everybody's for it, was mandatory E-Verify. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, so when you hire somebody, you make, you're able to check online you are already able, but you'd be required to check online whether the person is lying to you or telling you the truth about who they are and what the social security number is. Um, what are the prospects of something like that passing? Um, because, like I said, that's targeted. Everybody said they're for it, and yet it just keeps not happening. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think this is an example of where you have something of a silent conspiracy uh, between uh, the left uh, and Republicans. Um, who kind of reflexively favor the interest of big business. Um, obviously, E-Verify would make it much harder to employ illegal immigrants. And, you know, stories about false positives and glitches in the system, you know, those are 15 years old by this point. E-Verify is extremely easy to use. It's very effective. The failure rate is infinitesimally small. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you use it at your office for hiring? We use it, I, CIS uses I'd, it. Uh, I have to ask. Okay, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But the point is, it's the kind of thing I think it's now used for all, it's required for all government contractors. Mm -hmm. In fact, we looked at the numbers, and it seems that the majority of new hires are actually now already being screened mm -hmm. through it. So in a sense, it's reached a kind of tipping point. It seems to me yeah. that's a pretty se a selling point for yeah. kind of to overcome it's some our, of the objections it's already, you're talking It's already about. widely used. Right. Um, and, and I speak to, um, you know, senior business executives and in industries that do in certain parts of the country rely heavily on immigrant labor like hospitality um, and they frequently tell me is like look we think we need more workers we understand you don't see it that way but we use e-verify uh, and you know we want to make sure that every person who works here um, is legally authorized to be in this country and to work. Uh, that's part of the reason we do that is because when we say we need more workers we want to be able to say and all of our workers are legal as well um, but I think uh, there's still plenty of employers who would rather not do that, you know, who'd rather look the other way and benefit from, you know, the, um, you know, more control and more loyalty, as, as you right. said, yeah. in the H-1B context and lower wages. Um, and also people on the left that, you know, just in, um, you know, their, uh, their kind of uh, devotion to identity politics don't want to do anything that smacks of internal enforcement. Um, although, la again, last month at the Democratic debates, we saw that 
not only do they not want to enforce the law against anyone who's in this country illegally, whether they've been here 30 years or 30 hours, they also don't want to enforce the border either. Right, right, exactly. Um, this is an Arkansas-specific question. Um, Walmart's based in Arkansas. Do you, presumably, it's an important interest that yeah. you have interactions with. Have they weighed in on the immigration issue? I mean, is it... Yeah, we talked about, you know, Walmart uses E-Verify. Okay. Um, you know, they're a good corporate employer. They pay a good wage. Uh, I think their new wage is up now to 11 or $12 an hour, not just in Arkansas where that was mandated by the voters a couple of years back, but around the country as well. Um, I think, you know, they would like to see um, a immigration system that works for our communities, uh, but in terms of their employment practices, uh, they're a good corporate employer. Good, good. Um, this is a question from the audience, I'll expand it a little bit, is asking, in your tenure in office, how has attitudes toward enforcement changed among your colleagues? And what I want to focus that maybe on is, how have Republican members' attitudes changed on the immigration issue? Have you seen a shift? Because, you know, the old line is, the, you know, the left wants immigration because of the cheap votes and the right wants it for the cheap labor. But it seems that there's been more uh, it, the consensus has developed and expanded among Republicans more that there's been even those Republicans who maybe used to be kind of relaxed and lax on the immigration issue have become less so as they've seen the saliency of the issue. Is that something you've yeah, noticed I, as well? Yeah, I think that the president has affected that to a degree. Um, now I would say that for, for a long time though a lot of Republicans, especially those not intensely focused on the immigration issue, have always focused on illegal immigration because it's the issue that is maybe easiest to talk to voters about. Uh, and focus on, but it also um, allows them to focus on a legal immigration system that really rewards large employers in terms of guest workers and, and lots and more green cards um, that are going to benefit big businesses without necessarily benefiting American workers. Um, now, when you have situations like we have at the border now that is, is truly in crisis, um, I think most Republicans do generally want to try to solve that, it's just the Democrats don't. I, I would look at the enforcement attitudes, though, of my Democratic colleagues. Um, I mean, you know, the, the model of those bills that I oppose, not only when I was in the House, but just when I was a private citizen, um, goes back to 1986, and it was, you know, amnesty and mass migration up front in return for promises of enforcement. And the reason why those bills, one reason why those bills failed is that the 1986 bill failed, because you got the amnesty immediately, which is irreversible, and of course you got the uh, large increases in immigration, which a lot of Republican constituencies love, but you never got the enforcement. Bureaucrats delayed it, Cong or courts enjoined it, Congresses defunded it. Um, I, I don't, people keep talking about comprehensive immigration reform, which is the code word for that kind of uh, bill. Mass amnesty up front, promise of enforcement later. I don't think you could even have that kind of compromise today because the Democrats are no longer credible in their promises of future enforcement. Right. I mean, they're raising their hand saying we're going to decriminalize crossing the border and we're not going to deport anyone unless they commit a violent felony. So I don't see how you could even negotiate in good faith and have that kind of compromise with the Democrats anymore, given how radical their attitudes towards immigration enforcement have become. So in a sense, not only is Nancy Pelosi now the, the centrist wing of the Democratic Party, President Obama <laughs> is much more, uh, in a sense, almost a yeah. moderate Democrat because he obviously understood that dynamic to some degree and early on, even though there was a lot of sleight of hand and some of it was dishonest, yeah. they did try to make the point that they were committed to enforcement. Yeah, like, I mean, like they, they intentionally said uh, repeatedly as a, as a selling point for Obamacare that illegal immigrants would not be eligible for Obamacare. And now you, you've got poor Joe Biden getting attacked on those debate stages by Democrats who say that they deported too many illegal immigrants during the Obama-Biden years. It just goes to show you how, how radical the Democratic Party has become on the question of immigration. So Congressman Wilson, who called out, uh, you lie, was uh, actually proven correct. <laughs> um, the, um, the, uh, th this is a question on the southern border. Um, what are some of the measures you think we can take in the event of another big caravan approaching the border? Because the question, I mean, the measures the president has taken have maybe had some effect, yeah. but they haven't solved so this problem. I, so I think we'll have to see on a month-to-month -month basis where the numbers are. They, they have declined somewhat. Um, I, I hope that's because of the policy, which means it's durable and lasting, and not just, just because it's, it's hot. Weather, yeah. uh, not just because it's hot in June, July, and August uh, in the southern border. 
Um, but some of these policies are still early. Um, they still have to be fully implemented. They still have to be implemented, period, if a court has enjoined them. That's one reason why I was encouraged last week by the court's decision to overturn one of these left-wing injunctions out of California. I hope and I expect the Department of Justice will continue to seek accelerated appeals to the Supreme Court to prevent all these left-wing judges from trying to intervene in places where they have no business. It is, there is zero role for a federal judge to enjoin a decision between the government of Mexico and the United States government about whether Mexico will keep foreign nationals on its own soil. I mean, there's zero grounds for a federal judge to intervene in that kind of core foreign policy decision. That's a part of a broader issue is this injunctions, uh, that district court judges essentially have a veto over not only the executive branch, but over every other district court judge because yeah. there were those two dueling decisions where one district court judge upheld the administration yeah. policy, the other enjoined it, and the one who enjoined it won, basically. Yeah. And so is that a, is there a place there for Congress actually to intervene since all of those courts are simply a yeah, creation so, of Congress? Well, so I would like to see Congress uh, pass legislation that would uh, roll back district court judges right. um, in local communities around the country from enjoining laws nationwide. And that's, again, that's not even adjudicating the uh, question on the merits. That's giving it an uh, injunction up front before there's even been an adjudication on the merits of a particular policy or law. Um, you know, Justice Scalia used to say that nine unelected judges in Washington ought not to be setting critical policies for our country. They ought to be interpreting and applying the law. It's much worse than that now. It's not nine unelected justices in Washington about whom we have a major debate every time there's a nominee. Now we're letting unelected lawyers in San Francisco, who nobody's ever heard of, set immigration policy for this country. So again, I, I was heartened by the Supreme Court's decision last week. I hope that they, uh, acting on accelerated appeals by the Department of Justice, will continue to see, send a clear signal to all of these left-wing judges that they ought not be trying to set immigration policy from their courtroom. Well, thank you, Senator. I know you have to run. Um, the Senate's got important business to do, and um, I appreciate your giving us your time. This is uh, We're going to be posting this to the internet as well, to our website, um, and um, hopefully um, we'll have you back uh, when um, the RAISE Act passes. Yeah, so, hopefully. Thank, thank you, you very much. Appreciate it.